to put in rather than a stack of floppy disks. Um, you know, typed in the, the installation routines from our little checklist that we had printed out. Um, and we did automate. We used shell scripts in Perl because we had a lot of machines, and so it was important. Part of our, our ethos was to try to automate things as much as possible, but it wasn't really what we kind of know now as, as infrastructure as code. Um, and what kind of, um, I guess, inspired me, there's a site called, uh, or was a site called infrastructures.org. Is anyone familiar with that site? Has anyone seen it? It's, it's ancient now. It's still there, I think. Um, if you type the URL exactly right, um, but it's, it hasn't been updated since 1997, doesn't talk about cloud or even virtualization, uh, but it did talk about a couple of tools that I started out with uh, playing with these things. So FAI, does anybody know FAI, uh, fully automated install? It's basically a thing, it still exists, it's, uh, it's for hardware provisioning to where you can take your, your physical server, put it in the rack, plug it in the network and boot it and it will use Pixie Boot and TFTP and this kind of stuff, similar to Cobbler and Foreman and stuff, which are kind of more recent products that, that do this or tools that do this. Um, and it you know, automatically installs your server, and that was really cool. Um, and then the other thing that I learned from that site, the other tool, uh, was uh, CF Engine. Uh, anybody familiar with CF Engine? This is the, okay, a few people, that's good, that's good. This was the, pre the precursor to Puppet and Chef and Ansible and all this stuff, uh, written by a guy called Mark Burgess, who's kind of like the, I would say, the grandfather of, of infrastructure as code, although he might not appreciate uh, being called a grandfather. But, um, and, uh, and, and the, the, it was just the general principle of being able to rebuild a server being, as, a, as a, a good thing to be, um, uh, to treat them a little bit more as a commodity type of thing. <coughs> And then I kind of moved on to there to, uh, I worked for a, a few different companies which were mostly at that kind of post startup stage. So they'd kind of proven their business model and had enough funding and needed to expand and wanted to manage things in a more kind of a mature way, I guess. Um, and so there was kind of a progression of tools with things like VMware for virtualization, which was really, really neat. And then Puppet came out. Um, and then we moved on to AWS. Uh, and Chef and that kind of thing, and the DevOps, DevOps days and all that sort of thing became bigger. Um, and then about five and a half years ago, I joined ThoughtWorks, and that was really around, um, I was inspired by the book Continuous Delivery, which was just coming out at that time by a couple of, of uh, my now colleagues, or, or actually they've, they've since left, uh, Jez Humble and, and, um, and uh, Dave Farley. Um, and that kind of opened up my, my kind of range. So I got to work with a bunch of different companies and see how they do things and try to help them adopt different ways of working. And along the way, I often thought, so normally the case was that we would have to talk about, you know, people would get their information from blog posts and, and conference talks and things like that. And it was often hard to kind of pull together, especially with new people who didn't, weren't as kind of spending as much time doing those kind of things or kind of working. Um, uh, it, I always thought it would be nice to have like a book if somebody you know would, would write a book about this stuff to make it all kind of in one place some of these ideas and and nobody did so I finally kind of said all right I'll give it a go and um, so the book should come out um, in a couple of months time from now from O'Reilly it's available for pre-order um, we can get like the, a rough draft of the book and then get the final one when it does come out um, called Infrastructure as Code so that's kind of where I came for this stuff and so so one of the trends that we've seen is that it's all about the tools, right? You get um, organizations uh, will, will kind of go out and buy the products. They'll hear about Puppet or Chef or whatever. We'll go and buy that. We'll buy the, the uh, VMware. Now they're buying OpenStack and Cloud Foundry and all this kind of thing. Um, and they're hoping that, you know, we just buy that and install it and great, we're going to have, we're going to be like, you know, Netflix and Etsy and those other companies and Amazon. Um, but it's, it's not really enough. And, and in a lot of cases, the tools kind of run out of control. So what happened to me when I first started using VMware was, uh, you know, people would come and say, oh, can I have a server? We need a new environment for this or that. I say, fine, yeah, yeah, no problem. I just click, 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 and you got a new server. And then I ended up with, like, hundreds of servers. I was no longer constrained by having to buy uh, a physical piece of hardware to add servers. I just, you know, click a button and I have it. Um, and they were all kind of inconsistent and not patched and, and, you know, were just constantly fighting fires to kind of keep them running. Uh, so they're kind of more... There's more, there's more to it than that. So, some of the challenges we've seen. So, I've got a few of the kind of uh, um, the things that I, I, I talk about around uh, and that you hear about, like server sprawl, having all those servers that are difficult to kind of keep together, keep in shape. Configuration drift, where even if you use the same starting point, you might have a template or whatever, an AMI image on Amazon, 
where you you know spin up the same server multiple times, but then over time people make changes to it, things happen, and they become more and more different. And the issue that you get with this is even with your your automation tools like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, and so on. Um, you know, you can't always just, just run those, especially once your servers become a bit different. Running them becomes a bit um, finicky. You know, you try to run it against a group of servers and some work, some don't, some break. And so you start getting worried about running it and thinking, um, you know, we have to be a little bit, bit, bit careful and it, takes, it still takes manual effort. Uh, how many people here are using something like Puppet and Chef and that, that kind of thing here? So that's most of the people. How many people have it running continuously on a schedule without anybody you know, running it by hand and triggering it. So much fewer. So a few people are, but it's much fewer. That's, I mean, that's certainly how I started out using it, and exactly because of that. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some um, some of the ways to to kind of try to move in that direction. Uh, the, the the stuff on the right is kind of the the issues that you end up with, where you've got systems that are are not patched, don't necessarily represent test, doesn't necessarily represent production. Um, and you're still spending a lot of time manually doing stuff that you'd, you'd probably hope that you wouldn't have to do manually. So there's a common perception, this common concept that you have to trade off quality from, with speed. That you can either do things fast or you can do it well. And I believe this is, this is a false dichotomy. In reality, um, building things quickly actually slows you down. You can get something up quickly, but then um, it then becomes difficult to change. So the kind of more hastily you put something together, um, it, you know, it doesn't take long, it doesn't take very long at all really before the kind of technical debt and everything piles up and you, you, you um, even trivial changes now become something that you're, you're scared to do and they're going to take you a while and, and you, you have to put a lot of process around. The other thing is that a long change cycle doesn't improve the quality, in fact I'd argue it's, it's quite the opposite. So, um, you know, I've spent some time in, in uh, some of the larger organizations like banks and those kind of places which are very adamant that we have to have all this process, we have to have a lot of change control, a lot of kind of conversations and different people talking about every change. Um, and I've actually seen it kind of stated that, you know, if we add more time to our change process that will make things more reliable. And, and, and actually in, 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 in practice what you see there is that things are still a mess if not worse because you've got a lot of complexity. And fixing things takes a long time. If it takes a long time to make a good change, it either takes a long time to make a bad change, or you make, or you know, a, a fast change to fix a uh, an immediate emergency problem, um, or else you do that by just kind of throwing the process out the window, and, and that's not necessarily any better. So I think that the secret really is that being able to make your changes quickly helps you with quality, and there's there's a few reasons for that. One is that. Um, it's, it's, it's the kind of broken windows thing. If something is wrong, you see something wrong, how much of a barrier is it to go and fix it? If you can just go and, and make the change and know that you have processes, automated processes, what have you, to make sure that it's not going to break anything when you put it into production and you can turn that around within, say, minutes, um, that's obviously you're, you're going to be in the habit of fixing things rather than saying, well, okay, I've seen something that's wrong. It's not broken right now, but I'm worried about it. Um, in order to kind of get that addressed, I'm going to have to, you know, raise change requests and have meetings and all this kind of stuff. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, there's millions of those things broken and, and wrong anyways. Um, it just becomes a habit to kind of leave things in that state. The other reason why speed helps quality is that in order to be able to turn around changes quickly, to be able to do the kind of automated thing of, of uh, you know, really short cycle times to, to making a fix and getting it out to production, your systems have to be clean. They have to be in a... Uh, a good state, they have to be consistent, it's kind of a prerequisite, so um, it forces you, if, you're, if you really prioritize that, let's be able to make these changes quickly and confidently, um, it forces you to kind of make the system design changes and, and, and kind of fix and clean up things that you need to in order to be able to do that. And also it forces you to have obviously your process for making the changes has to be good and well proven and, and something you can believe in. So one way to define infrastructure as code is it's, you're able to apply kind of software engineering tools and practices and techniques to infrastructure, things like version control and test-driven development and continuous integration. And obviously we can do that because it's become programmable. You can put it into a file and treat it like source code. Um, in particular, I think you can, um, 
you can use the kind of those, those agile techni techniques like I, I mentioned, um, suddenly become something you can bring to it and have a really kind of quality focused approach to how you get your infrastructure changes made as well as your software changes. So for me the goal is to make sure that you can, can continuously get changes through and make sure that they're, they're, every change is validated thoroughly uh, before it goes through to production. Um, and this is a way of kind of lowering the cost of doing that and making that easier as a, as a habit. So some of the kind of key principles or, or goals is you want to be able to easily rebuild any part of your infrastructure. You want to have everything configured consistently. Uh, know that the way that you do anything, make changes, is, is, is repeatable, um, not in people's heads, but actually in a, uh, transparently in a script or a tool or whatever that people can see and understand. Um, and you also need to assume that everything is going to change. And, and this is a big one, and I think we often look at our current state of our systems and say, oh, this is such a mess. And then we, we draw up this perfect plan of how it's going to be after we kind of, you know, if we just get the time and we get the kind of uh, support, um, we're going to do the big initiative and we're going to bring it to this perfect state. And of course, we don't actually get to that perfect state because we learn things along the way, especially when that perfect state involves us use all the shiny new tools and the techniques and all that kind of stuff. And then you start doing it and you learn things and, and you have to be able to adapt. You have to be ready to kind of accept that we're starting out with one tool and we might learn later on that it's not the right one, so we're going to chuck it out and do something different. And you have to get comfortable with that, which was, it is difficult in our industry. I think we often struggle um, being comfortable with, with changing course. So some of the key practices are keeping all your infrastructure in those definition files, those cookbooks, manifests, uh, Terraform files, cloud formation templates, whatever it may be, and putting them into version control. And then proving the production readiness for every change. So every time you make a change to one of those and commit it to, to your version control, you want to uh, have it automatically proven um, that it is production ready without people having to spend a lot of time going through process to do that uh, by continuously testing those. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, infrastructure pipelines. There's lots of different kind of things that you can do with, with infrastructure as code and uh, different kind of angles to the problem. But for this thing that I've been talking around, around how do you make changes and, and do that confidently, the pipeline is a key concept. And this is, um, obviously it's for the, the kind of continuous delivery deployment pipeline concept just applied to your infrastructure. So some of the things that you want your pipeline to do is immediately and, and thoroughly validate each change. So I'm not really a believer in kind of nightly builds and that kind of stuff because I think that makes too long a feedback loop and gives you too much stuff to look at if it breaks. It's really nice when I make a change, push it, uh, see if it works or not, and then I can kind of move on um, comfortably. And then progressively testing things, so where you've got a more complex system with different moving parts, you can have that kind of progression of first test the one thing and make sure it's all right, that kind of unit test and what have you, um, and then integrate it in with some more things in another stage and test those, those all together, and then kind of push it along through the pipeline into production. And supporting manual validation is an important thing because a lot of people have the impression when we talk about continuous delivery and continuous deployment pipelines, and what that means is a developer uh, commits something and it goes in and just goes straight to production. You know, okay, some tests might run, but you know, it's, it's kind of willy-nilly, it's a bit dangerous and scary. Um, and some organizations do that, and they do, they do, or they do that with certain parts of their systems, um, but actually having manual steps uh, where somebody can um, have a look at things and, and particularly uh, if you have more kind of rigorous controls or maybe legal and compliance kind of things where you have to make sure that a couple of different people have looked at a change before it goes through. And so you can do that without kind of, uh, uh, you know, violating the, the, the rules of continuous delivery. It's, it's totally acceptable. Um, the important thing is that you, you apply your changes. The way that they're applied uh, is done consistently in all of your environments. And that is, it's, it's kind of an effortless thing, so it doesn't require somebody, with the, you know, a particular person with particular knowledge to know how to do this thing. That knowledge should be captured in those kind of scripts and automation. Um, and so that pretty much anybody can kind of push the button and, and make it happen, and know that it will happen right. So I'm going to give an example, a kind of, not quite code level, but, but maybe just a little bit um, more of a picture of, of how uh, pipelines might work in practice. For, for infrastructure. So um, uh, you may not be able to read all of this, but just 
we're, we're basically saying let's take, in a, take a, a team of kind of mixed roles and developers and, and infrastructure types and, and testers and whatnot, and they've got a Java application uh, maybe built with Drop Wizard, so it's a Java file that you can just execute. Um, and uh, not using containers at this point, or you know, maybe not quite, quite there yet. Um, and we want a sustainable process. Uh, so we're saying we're starting out on this project, and we want a sustainable process where we can deliver the software and infrastructure changes, and as we grow, that this kind of process will, will grow with it. So we'll start with a Trailblazer pipeline, or also sometimes called a, a, a Tracer Bullet pipeline. The idea of this is that it's a very minimal pipeline, so we're not thinking ahead to the all singing, all dancing, what it might be in the future, but let's just say we have a hello world application uh, and just a couple of simple stages that gets through to a, a, a production-ish environment um, and uh, just to kind of make sure that we can get the kind of things going end to end and then we can kind of build it up, we can add the kind of tests and, and more parts of the application and evolve our, our environments and everything as we go along. Um, but this gives us kind of the backbone, the, the method that we can use to do those changes and evolve our platform. So if we have a, an initial architecture where it's just a single application that doesn't need a database, um, answers to HTTPS, um, and at this point we're not going to worry about load balancing and scaling and all that kind of stuff, we're just going to keep it simple. Um, so we just want one application server per environment, um, let the traffic get rooted to it, and um, block access, so we do want to kind of secure it. We don't want to kind of, um, you know, be, be too sloppy in what we're doing in this day and age. So we're going to make sure to block all of the, the connections and all of our environments, except from uh, from our office for now. And so one of the first kind of things that um, decisions that we need to make, and again, this is a provisional decision, which is what we're going to start with and maybe change later on, is our our platform. And I use the term dynamic infrastructure platform rather than cloud or something like that because there are actually different kind of flavors. Um, people do this stuff with hardware, with, with automated provisioning. So there was an article recently from, uh, or a blog post, I think it was from Spotify, where they talk about their tools and systems that they, how they evolved over time from the data center. They've recently started kind of moving to Google's uh, cloud. Um, but they've got a lot of kind of tooling around. Um, bare metal hardware and, and automatically provisioning it, you know, stick it in a rack, like I was saying from, from my kind of early days, um, and then it gets added into the, you know, the, the systems. And Etsy is another company that actually uses bare metal and, and data centers rather than cloud. Um, and so, yeah, so you can do it with bare metal, you can do it with uh, virtualization like VMware. Um, the important things, I think, are that it needs to be programmable uh, and on-demand and self-service. So. This going back to that whole thing of the tools and, and, and installing a tool and thinking, yeah, we're now, now we're cloud. Um, I've seen several organizations recently which have installed OpenStack in their data centers and said, yeah, we've got private cloud now. It's really great. It's like, great. Well, well how do I get a server? But in some cases, it's like, you know, send, send us a ticket and we'll use OpenStack to create the server for you. And it takes us only 15 minutes compared to, uh, uh, you know, it used to take us all day. And it's like, well, how long does it take it for me as an, as an application team? Well, so it still takes you, you know, three, four weeks because we've got to do all these things to it. Um, and even in some organizations, it's like, okay, we've got a portal. You can create the server yourself with OpenStack. You know, you can get it within 15 minutes. You've got your server. That's awesome. Can't log into it yet. Again, need to raise tickets, ask somebody to create accounts for you, install packages and this and that, and configure it. And it's like, that's not, you know, I don't care. You can call it cloud. You can call it whatever you want. But to, for this stuff to work, it needs to be something where I, as a developer or an application team or somebody who's using the infrastructure, um, can, you know, write my Terraform file or whatever it may be, scripts, um, and have it just run and, and automatically create the, the environments without having to ask somebody to do it for me. Um, and there's a lot to, to making that work. And so in the kind of larger organizations where, where there is a lot of concern about letting people go and, and create infrastructure willy-nilly, a lot of what we do with the pipeline, we can do with the pipeline and say, look, we can put things into this that will uh, give you the assurance that you need. You know, we can put automatic checks to make sure that in, it first goes to a test environment, runs tests against it that check that, for instance, ports aren't open that shouldn't be open, there's no user accounts or processes on those servers that shouldn't be there, um, and if they are, then we can stop it in the pipeline. And, and that can be a way to kind of build that confidence that, look, you know, this, this isn't about throwing away controls and, and um, you know, being unsafe, it's just about doing it in a, in a more effective way, really. So, 
Um, for our kind of uh, example, we've, we've picked AWS just because it's something that people on the team know and it's very kind of easy to get started with. We might change it later on, who knows, but it's fine. So the next thing we need to decide is how are we going to manage our servers? How are we going to, it's one thing to kind of create servers, but how are you going to keep them updated and make changes to them over time? And I see a couple of different approaches. One is the old fashioned, let's just do it by hand and, and configure it by hand. And obviously that's something we want to move beyond. Um, continuous synchronization is a term I use for that way that Puppet and Chef and Ansible and those tools are designed to work where they run continuously, reapply the configuration to the machine. Um, and so they keep everything kind of in sync. Uh, a, a lot of people, or some people at least, are, are into immutable servers, which is the idea that uh, you put kind of all the configuration into that template. So for AWS, it's the AMI image. You use maybe a tool like Packer, put your application into, into there and, and have that AMI kind of have everything that it needs. And then you can just spin up instances. And you know that if you test, if you spin up an instance and test it, and then spin up another instance off that say, same AMI later on, it's exactly the same. No changes have kind of crept in. There have been no kind of, say, package updates or anything like that, which might make it kind of invalidate your tests potentially. Um, and then the idea there is that if you want to make a change to your configuration, you rebuild that AMI and then relaunch your server instances. This is something that Netflix does as a, as a matter of course. Um, and then another approach is that containerized approach, the kind of stuff that Pini was talking about earlier on, um, where you try to put as much as possible into the containers, um, use orchestration, scheduling, what have you, to, to run those. And then um, the host systems that run those can be much simpler. You might still use one of the other techniques. You might use something like Puppet or whatever to manage your host servers. But those host servers actually become very, very simple, and, 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 and managing those is uh, much less complicated than it might be otherwise, because it just needs to be able to run your, uh, your container system. Um, so for our example, we're going to just use the kind of classic infrastructure as code, uh, continuous synchronization. We're going to use Ansible because it's, it's fairly easy to get started with. The team is happy with that. Uh, some other kind of initial tech choices. So there's the infrastructure definition tool, and this is that level above the kind of puppet and chef thing of saying, how do I define, you know, a group of servers, networking rules, and and, and you know the kind of bigger pieces of things. Um, and so Terraform is a tool that um, um, I've used on a, a number of projects. I find the syntax. I tend to use that. So for going with AWS, they have cloud formation, which works quite well. And a lot of teams which are primarily AWS are more than happy using that. Um, but the syntax is a lot more difficult to understand. And so as somebody who's like, uh, you know, working on a book and blog posts and, and presentations, uh, Terraform looks a bit more tidy when I have to show the code. Um, and then for the template, we're going to use for the moment just the kind of off-the-shelf Amazon Linux AMI. Um, later on, we might decide that we want to make customizations to that basic server template. Uh, we might use something like Packer, but to get started with, remember this is our Trailblazer pipeline, we're just going to grab something off the shelf and use that for now. And then uh, we can use the, the Go CD server, uh, which is an open source um, uh, made by my company, which is um, one of the reasons I'm familiar with it. Um, and uh, we can use that to, to, to kind of um, do the kind of the, the pipeline and the stages and all that sort of thing. So. Looking at the kind of materials in the pipeline, so uh, things that go into our, our version control system are things like obviously the application source code. We're also going to put the Terraform file and our Ansible um, playbooks, I don't think I put in there, um, can all go in. It's a single application. We're just going to bung it all in that, that single re re repo. Uh, we've also got the AMI as kind of an input. And then one of the things that's going to come out is this, this jar file that's going to get built in, in the pipeline. And so what goes into our, our infrastructure definition that we're using with Terraform um, is essentially uh, we've, we're building this template. We want to be able to reuse this template across multiple environments. So another kind of, I guess I'd say, anti-pattern that, that I sometimes see is where people take these kind of tools and say, I'm going to have one file, one CloudFormation file from my test environment, and another copy of that. I'm going to copy that and have a separate file that I use for my QA and for my prod. And then you've got to try to kind of keep the changes all synced up between there, whereas what you'd really um, better off doing is having a single file that you can kind of parameterize and say I'm going to pass the parameters that are per environment um, and that way you get that kind of consistency across environments. And so uh, this file is just going to uh, 
define a VPC, a subnet, so some networking kind of stuff for our application, a um, security group to kind of control um, uh, those inbound connections, and then um, an instance, a single server instance. Um, again, at this point, we're not worrying about auto scaling and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, our Ansible playbook will uh, will just kind of just make sure the JVM is installed and has the right version, um, set up the directories, put the application in place, and just do some 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 fairly basic stuff on there. And Ansible is going to run Terraform will run that um, as a provisioner. We'll run Ansible, um, and then our our CD agent will actually execute An Ansible. So I'll, I'll uh, I think the next slide shows the kind of pipeline. So yeah, this is our, our simple pipeline. So. We've got these different kind of files that people can commit into source control. As soon as one of those is committed, it triggers the build stage. Um, and that probably just does validation. It will, so it'll build and run unit tests on the jar file, uh, on the application file. Uh, for like the Terraform and the Ansible, it'll probably just do some syntax checking. And, and later on, we could add some kind of unit testing level things where it doesn't actually provision infrastructure. It just kind of um, it does some basic quick checks. Then once we've done that, we run to the test stage, and that's actually going to provision some infrastructure and run some tests with something like, say, server spec um, to make sure that everything hangs together, as well as whatever kind of test we might run on the application. And then uh, we have a kit. And this is a, a pattern that I've used on a lot of pro projects um, where we have like a, a software development team coming in and starting out. And this is kind of like the minimum pipeline that we tend to start out with. We, we usually do have uh, testers on our team. So we'll have a QA stage where the tester can pick a build that has passed, they, they know that it's been validated automatically, um, you know, gets all those tests, and they can deploy it and kind of um, try to break it using their, their human creativity. Um, and then when they're happy with that, it can get pushed onto the production stage. Uh, and so the way we manage the environments here is that, again, we've got that Terraform file, that gets pushed from one, um, one stage to the next. Um, when it uh, when a deploy happens, basically it is on the kind of the the, the, the agent machine um, that executes Terraform, um, and so this makes sure that our rather than running it off of our local uh, laptop, which we might do when we're kind of like developing changes before we push it into the, the source control, but once it's in these environments, we want it to be in that controlled environment so we know what the the uh, the agent looks like. It's that's been itself built in a consistent way so that we know that in every environment it's going to run the same way. It's not going to be run in different in production because there's a different person doing it on their laptop who's configured it differently. And also, if we do get a failure in any of these, in any of these stages um, or problem, we don't go and kind of fix the code there. Uh, we go back, do it in the, you know, in the, the source, push it through the pipeline again. Um, and this is where it helps to make sure that you've, you overall you keep this this whole process quite quick and, and, and well streamlined so that it, be, it is a reasonable and easy way to do it rather than becoming too painful and making you want to say, let's take a shortcut and just edit the file on the server. And then the next time somebody makes a commit, they haven't got the fix that you applied manually and it gets overwritten and you get that regression. So that's kind of our, our um, basic pipeline. And we can kind of, there's various ways we can then start expanding that and evolving it as we go. So one of them is we can add more services. So if we're doing like a microservices kind of thing, we say we're going to split that initial service into a few different services. Um, in this case, we're going to say that there's two UI front ends. So one might be the user facing, and one might be like an admin interface or something. And for the moment, it's still a single back end. <coughs> and so then we might have a, a fan end pipeline design where each of those services has got its own little kind of branch that starts out on its own, builds that piece, and maybe deploys um, that one service on its own without the others so that we can run tests on that without having to kind of bring everything together. So that can just, the, the, the idea is that the earlier stages should run much faster and give us that feedback faster. And then if something fails here in the system integration test, uh, we know it should be something that is caused by the integration and not a problem um, with an individual component. If, if it does turn out to be that, then we look at, okay, what tests can we add in here to kind of catch it earlier so that we don't have it in here. What also helps is when every time somebody is committing and pushing it into the pipeline, uh, that section of the, the pipeline runs. And then this is being run, this join stage here is only run uh, because of a change to one of the inputs. So if it does fail, you don't have to kind of go through all the stuff to try to figure out what went wrong. You know, well, everything else 
it passed last time with those B and C. A is the only thing that's changed, so it's got to be something we changed there that caused it. And so this is the idea of having a, um, we're in these different services, we're still keeping the infrastructure definitions in with each service. And we're now giving each service a little bit of its own uh, configuration. So we've got the, the overall stuff, the VPC and all of that, we've defined in, in one of the services. So the backend service here defines the, the VPC and some of the networking stuff. And then the individual services have some, uh, basically what they need for their own service, so their own instance, their own server instance, it defines the Ansible script uh, that needs to run. And uh, if we add things like auto-scaling, um, load balancing, and that kind of stuff, we can do that per application, and each application can kind of control for itself, you know, these are the rules for me to, to do the auto-scaling. And that pattern, that fan-in pattern kind of works up to a point, but then over time, it starts becoming difficult. Um, as you get more services, and particularly as you get more different teams working on things, it starts to become a bottleneck. And one of the kind of signs that we see is where we start talking about, well, we need to coordinate our releases. You know, if, if you know, that team is going to release something, it affects us. And so we need to start putting in some overhead. Let's get in some project managers and some, uh, you know, we need to hire some more QAs because we need to kind of schedule um, uh, you know, we need to have schedules around the releases and all that. And that's what leads to, as, as you know, things grow beyond a certain point, you end up kind of going back to having really long release times, really long change cycles. So uh, a pattern that a lot of um, teams do is to try to decouple those individual things so they could be released on their own. Um, and this is one of those things that... Um, it's nice that you know your team can release your code without having to coordinate too much with other teams, but it does add complexity. You do not need to start thinking about things like how do you manage APIs and dependencies between things, um, you know, backwards compatibility and all that kind of stuff. So this is where, again, some teams will tend to kind of jump straight into this, and because they've seen, oh, this is what you know, this is what the, the bigger organizations do. This is what uh, you know, so we need to kind of do that. But when you're smaller, it actually gives you a lot of overhead. So I kind of prefer to start with those kind of simpler things and then when you start feeling the pain, and that's when you kind of want to split out. Um, and so you need things like a configuration registry potentially to say, so my infrastructure uh, needs to know what, I don't know, addresses or ports or, or things to, to talk to um, somebody else's uh, microservices. So you start needing things like service discovery, configuration registries, those kind of things to coordinate. Um, and uh, in per environment, you need to think about some, maybe those common infrastructure. <clears throat> so this is kind of, again, it's one, one pattern. So this is not too different from what we saw before. The, the, the main difference is that um, we've, we've now taken out this, this Terraform file uh, for the, 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 over, the, the overall stuff and broken it out into its own little project. Um, <coughs> so this is a pattern I've used on a couple of <coughs> projects. It's a little bit controversial. Some people are really uncomfortable with that. Some people think it's great. Um, but it does it can become a little bit dangerous so um, in that it become it can become that bottleneck of if you're going to make this change it affects everybody so you know again do we need to be a lot more careful and, and maybe we do but in order to, to to reduce the impact it's best to kind of keep that as small and simple as possible don't put too much into that so um, a typical pattern is to put things like VPCs this is talking about AWS in particular here um, subnets and security groups at kind of a global level, things that might not change all that much. And then, uh, again, the applications have kind of their own infrastructure that they can change without having to impact other people. Again, auto-scaling, load, you know, load balancing are the, the, the classic things. Um, and so the pipelines start looking a bit like this. Um, don't remember, let me just have a quick... Yeah, so, it's, so, so each, kind of, each group can kind of release their own stuff uh, without referring to other groups. Now you can get some more complicated things, I'm not going to go into it tonight, but um, you get into more complicated things about managing your dependencies. So how do I test, you know, if, if service A requires, you know, connects to service B to do things, can I get like test instances or, or how, how, you know, what are some different things I can do to, to make sure that before I go into production, I'm happy that, that uh, you know, I'm not going to break um, because of a change that happened to, to service B and, and vice versa. <coughs> 
Now with infrastructure, when you break your infrastructure out into its own pipelines or aspects of infrastructure, like you might do this with your, your AMIs or other kind of servers, uh, server templates or things like Terraform files, or if you have libraries of things like your Ansible or, or cookbooks or things like that, you might um, start managing those as libraries with their own kind of little pipeline. Uh, one of the things I've found out um, useful and I found a very hard way is to, to, to have those some testing on that before they go in. So on an early project, um, I had some chef cookbooks that managed the Etsy hosts file on, on all of our servers. Um, and not only were we not kind of running that in, in a separate test environment beforehand, we were actually just kind of applying it to all of our, our pre-production. We, we had separate production, but like all of our kind of test and QA environments. So I pushed a change to that cookbook, uh, and, and it mangled the host's file, and then you couldn't log into anything anymore, and you couldn't even run kind of chef to, to fix the thing. You had to go in and do it by hand. I had to go in and do it by hand. And uh, the, the lead developer in that project said, that's, that's a dev oops. Um, so, um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, <laughs> I, as I said, the hard way I learned, to, to, so like things like that, like that cookbook, I would run some kind of validation on it, have it spin up a little server, do some basic checks to say, does, you know, does it still work and I still can log into it, um, before I then inflict it on the, the development pipeline. And there's lots of other stuff I haven't gone into. I just kind of tried to cover one very kind of quick aspect of things, but there's the idea of autonomous operations. So I think that goes back to that thing of letting things run on its own um, rather than having to have somebody tend to your automated process. Uh, managing server templates, things like AMIs, you can do a similar way with, with having pipelines. Um, immutable server is a whole topic on its own. Containers. Uh, continuous disaster recovery uh, is just this idea of if you're able to have your systems automatically build and rebuild themselves, it's not that hard to, um, you know, it should be a routine thing, right? So rather than your disaster recovery plan being something that is, you know, behind the glass, break this, and if there's an emergency, and, you know, we cross our fingers and hope it works, and we, we kind of know it probably won't, um, uh, it should be based on the same processes that you use to deploy um, and apply changes. So. You know, recovering a failed server should just be, yeah, we rebuild it, we rebuild servers multiple times a day, it's nothing, nothing new. Um, and that kind of goes to the whole Netflix chaos monkey and simian army type of thing where they make sure that they are routinely testing uh, what happens when things break um, and work for the teams. So that's pretty much what I've got for tonight. Um, have any questions? What is it, the vulture? Is the vulture, everybody asks about the vulture. Um, so uh, this is, um, so there's, in O'Reilly, there's a, a little group that picks the animals that go in the covers, and you don't get any say. It's just like, here, you've got a vulture, and it's like, you have to decide, oh, it's, it's just this ugly, ugly-ass bird, or say, oh, it's actually quite cool, it's a really bad-ass bird. This particular vulture is a Rupel's griffin. It's an um, endangered African bird. It's the highest flying bird in the world. It's one of them was sucked into a jet engine at like 20 or 30,000 feet. Um, so I think it's, it's cool. Where did you come up with your own Before you wrote So where did I come up with it? It was a lot of it was, so that was kind of learning in the early days in the companies that I worked with that I mentioned. And then I have, I have visited a lot of companies and talked to people um, and the usual kind of reading uh, blog posts and going to conferences and talking to people there, so it's just kind of that, yeah. What's your opinion about bacon versus frying? Bacon versus frying, I'm not familiar with that. Baking everything in the image or doing everything post post? Ah, okay. Um, so the question is, um, do you put everything into your, your image or do you put everything onto the server as you, you create instances? Um, and so the baking kind of thing is that's the, the immutable server when you take that to the, the extreme and say we put everything onto the AMI. Um, and there are advantages to that, right? It's, it means that you're, you're not doing any kind of extra stuff. So if you're kind of every time you bring up a, a server of the same type, you're going and downloading, you know, um, apps get update or whatever it is, all your packages. Like you're kind of doing the same stuff over and over again and using a lot of network resources potentially. Um, and also maybe building them differently each time, you know, there could be some differences each time, even if you pin the versions of packages, you get those kind of um, transitive dependencies and stuff. So um, I kind of like the, 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 the baking thing, but I have found there are parts that are, are 
good to do at, at um, instantiation time just for um, speed or not for yeah for, for speed because so in a development pipeline if you have a team who's doing that microservices thing so maybe they've got five ten microservices um, and they're committing changes throughout the day you're constantly building and testing that pipeline is running all the time if it takes you five to ten minutes to build an AMI that's a long time um, so what I've often found ourselves doing is baking a, an AMI that has pretty much everything except for our microservice and it has a script like a cloud init type script that runs um, so you pass it in when you create it and say here's the service name here's the version you know where to go get it you know so it downloads it and, and has a standard process to kind of unpack it um, and that was kind of a good trade-off um, networking mm -hmm. uh, physical switches routers so whether it's physical or not I'm not too bothered about. I mean, I think there are, you know, there are situations where you, you do want to use them. I, I think it, it's these days it's got to be programmable um, one way or another. It has to be software defined. And I think that it's not as mature that, that, that the technology and tools for that aren't as mature and certainly not as widespread and, and well understood. But it's a pain point. So um, I was at a, a, a banking organization a couple of months ago and they had installed uh, OpenShift for a PaaS type of thing, such containers and all that groovy stuff. Um, but the networking was still old-fashioned. You still had to, to call, you know, send out a request. To, Can you please? And the, the problem was, it's a different groups. So the networking folks, like they, they like tell me what IP address for your your service. And it's like, well, it, it changes, right? You know, it's dynamic. And, and so this is one of those links that's got to come along. And storage as well, um, and monitoring. Somebody mentioned monitoring in, in terms of the software-defined networking. Um, and the monitoring is another thing that tends to not really understand that you know servers disappear and new ones appear, and it, it's okay. <laughs> Don't cry about it. Still, so not not a definite solution, or that, that's there's there's stuff out there. I haven't had as much experience other than you know with the the the, the um, tools for managing your like your hardware type uh, networking devices programmatically. Um, so I don't have quite as much to say about that other than you know having used like the, the cloud based things. Um, but yeah, I, I do think it's necessary. Thank you. Uh, I think implicitly you're more or less saying that the boundary between you as an infrastructure provider and a consumer is a telephone firm. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to look at it. So the boundary between the, the kind of infrastructure provider and say application team or what have you is that, that file and the, the system and tooling that, that executes that. Yeah, it's, it's a, that's kind of the definition of a platform in a way really, isn't it? Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it gives you like a contract. Um, yeah, this is what we support, this is what we have available. Um, this is what we'll do, but it also gives you that kind of common language. So, you as an infrastructure person don't have to be involved every time an application team says, "Oh, I want to add more RAM to a server or what have you," but you still have the ability to kind of go in and see what people are doing and say, oh, "Wait, I'm not really comfortable with this. Let's kind of talk about that and, and, and fix it." Uh, so, somebody over here, their, their hand up. <laughs> version two, man. I'm just, I'll be glad when version one is out. <laughs> <laughs> How would you manage your uh, DSA file if your environment is getting big? Your which file, sorry? Your Terraform state file. Terraform state file. Uh. That's one thing I'm still thinking about. How do you get in a big organization? Yeah. You only have one state file. Yeah. You put in the or whatever, but. So with Terraform and, and, and CloudFormation and those kind of things, you can get up into the kind of monolithic. Um, infrastructure stack, or you've got one big file that defines everything, and then of course you can't touch it, right, because you'll, you'll break everything. Um, <clears throat> so most of those tools have a kind of a modular concept, so you can kind of import modules, but that still ends up with, you import a bunch of modules and you still create this one big thing, a single state file in the case of Terraform, and it, it can still be brittle. So I'm quite... This is kind of what I see. I, I see looking at infrastructure like microservices so I think you need to break it up into, into smaller, digestible, easily managed pieces that you can deploy separately and manage separately. And yes, there is kind of there, there's concerns around sharing. So you're, you're going to have everybody kind of doing the same thing. Maybe they're doing it different ways. But I think you have to manage that in different ways. So again, you can do it as a library thing. It's okay. Here is the the, the Terraform module that you can use to do this. You know, to, to I don't know, set up your monitoring or whatever it is for your service. Um, that doesn't mean that everybody's is all in one big state file. It's like my service is going to import that and use it in my own little piece, and I'm, I'm, I'm standardized that way. You treat it like a library, 
And then you can also have the option to do things like versioning to say, okay, the, the uh, monitoring team has come out with a new, uh, a new kind of file for that. Um, we're not sure. We we ran it through our pipeline and it broke, so we're going to kind of roll back and pin to a previous version. You know, th there's various things you can do when you can decouple it. I think you have to treat it that way, like like software. Any other questions? Who owns the state file? <laughs> Who owns the state file? I mean, I think it's it's part of the pipeline in a way because I mean you should be executing. So you, should, you know, for each of these environments, you're going to have a state file, right? Um, you, you do have to worry about, so where do you manage that? You don't want it to sit on the agent because you want agents to be kind of disposable. So this is where those kind of server side things, putting it in S3 or in, in Atlas, if, if, if you're into that. Um, that's probably the way to go. Does that get to what you're wondering? Well, I was more thinking, is it the provider, so the infrastructure the party or the consumer? I think it's, so if it's your pipeline, you own it, right? So if it's your pipeline that executes it and, and builds that infrastructure, you own that infrastructure, it's your state file, yeah. Okay, thanks.